Hey there fellow Cleophiles, I am Pruitt and this is Jim Davis and on today's WebDM we're going to take a walk through history and find out which events should be burned into your game, an age of reasons on why you should use them, but fear not, it will not take us a hundred years to depict this art of war, it is historical events inspiring your D&D game on WebDM. This week's sponsor is DungeonCraft, Hell and High Water by 1985 Games. Build your own battle maps in no time at all by using over a thousand pieces of gorgeous reversible terrain. And Hell and High Water is about demons and pirates. What more do you need to play D&D? They've got ships, demons, ancient evils, ports, hellish wastelands, ancient architecture, infernal machines, sunken relics, and more. They're a cool looking, easy to store, and affordable way to level up your combat. We've used Dungeon Craft in most of our home games since we got it. We can't say enough good things about them. Check it out, link in the description and comments. Now Jim, when we say historical events as inspiration for your games, what do we mean by using historical events as inspiration for your games? <laughs> right, uh, I mean there's lots of different ways, right? And, and we're gonna be talking about the way specifically that you can use certain historical events as a way to like frame your campaign, mm -hmm. provide good like background sort of chatter <laughs> for the world that the players can get involved with, uh, you know, as is their want, mm -hmm. uh, or just to like provide a, a setup. This event or this time period like really interests me. I want to take that and mm -hmm. take what interests me and like mix it up a little bit. And then we're gonna go. It's gonna be like alt history <laughs> or you know, yeah, something like do that. some Harry Turtle Dove action. And we could be talking about something that's like strict historical gaming like we're gonna this is the historical period we want to dive into and we're gonna reshape the rules of the game so that it reflects that or you could just be talking about like hey i really love this period of history mm -hmm. or this particular culture or society or whatever i'm gonna just take it take what i like about it remix it and then put it in my own homebrew. So it's like, it runs the gamut oh, yeah. of what you can do. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, you know, George R.R. Martin, he used the War of the Roses for right. a Song of Ice and Fire. Certainly, you know, as, yeah. a, as a broad landscape, right? Yeah, that's a good example of it. Because it's like, if you're familiar with the War of the Roses, you can tell. You can the see- The Lancasters <laughs> instead of right, the Lannisters. Right, yeah. 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 You can tell which one's going on, but it's also like, usually, you know, in the historical record is those events are much richer and more complex and mm -hmm. more, uh, engaging ultimately than the stories that inspire them. So what I take from the George R. R. Martin example is like, we could go deeper, <laughs> you know, yeah. as as uh, as great as uh, Ice and Fire is, there's part of it that doesn't quite capture that richness. Yeah. And so this is one of those things where it's like investigating these, finding out what mm -hmm. it is that you want, even if it's just like a surface level inspiration. Like you said, it could be the background for your, your campaign, but I mean, you could also use these just for like, certain adventures certain or adventure way. arcs yeah, yeah or even breaking it down to just like certain like scenarios or scenes right, yeah. right the perspective on this that i like to keep is one where the actions of individuals still matter yeah like you you know there's a point of history where you're looking at it and like what in, what any one person does in any given moment rarely matters mm -hmm. as opposed to like the collective action of everybody doing you know uh, reacting to something yeah and that's sort of like macro history big big history type thing and then there's the opposite which is basically biography yeah. you know <laughs> you're looking at one person and how they move through events i kind of like the middle ground between those two yeah, yeah i like it where the people the historical actors are still important you can still get those quirky little like personalities and, and you know like this courtier or this monarch or this diplomat or whatever their personality had an impact on uh, you know what happened mm -hmm. but not so much that I can't like find the big picture to take to my RPG you know what I mean? right, sometimes right, well, biography get that yeah okay so that leads me to my next question. so why why do this <laughs> like I mean like I mean we've talked yeah. about drawing inspiration from pop culture and like yeah. movies and stuff but right. and I think this is a good like you know bookend for that Sure, yeah, uh, certainly. But why? Why? Because of the richness involved. Because yeah. uh, one of the things you learn when you really do a deep dive of history is like, first off, most of what you learned probably in you know your primary education or coming up was, was just a, a thin gloss, <laughs> just to give you a, an idea of what was out there. The cliff notes of the cliff notes. <laughs> right. And by necessity, right? Like if you, went in, if you did a deep dive on everything, you'd still be in school. What it does is it gives people like sort of a false sense of what certain historical periods were like, and because these are fantasy games based on historical periods, knowing more about the historical periods that are represented in the game, in this case, 
you know, Western European medieval is where we start, but the whole world is open to us. Learning what that was like, learning the intricacies of it, you know, take just medieval history in general. It is a complex web of these, what appear to be contrasting and conflicting forces at work in history. There's sort of a desire for personal prestige of the monarch and mm -hmm. honor, and the fact that you read about historical events and it's like, why in the world is this king treating this other king this way when they're an enemy that they both would not want to, you know, spend any time with? In this case, say like the kings of, I don't know, Austria and Bohemia or something versus the Mongols. And you're like, why wouldn't you all get together in your own self interest? So it's like, it's the alienness of it, the, mm -hmm. the separateness of it because of time and, and the difficulty of like putting yourself in that mindset means that when you're trying to emulate those things at your table and you're trying to like have a believable and, and uh, you know, engaging world, if you have actual examples to draw from, if you can actually go like, no, this is how people reacted, mm -hmm. or this is like, this is the, the attitude of a noble at that time, you're doing something to further help transport your players to a different place. Yeah. And they might never really pick up on it. They might think like, oh God, I don't want to have to deal with, <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever from history. But uh, if you negotiate with your players and talk to them, man, you could just really add a richness to your game that, that can elevate it. What are some of the different uh, events or time periods that you've used, actually used in your games? Right, right. So the one that I've used and been inspired by the most uh, so far in games I've actually run is late antiquity. So this is roughly from around the time of say, uh, Constantine the Great uh, and the Roman Empire through the fall of the western half of the Roman Empire. So I'm talking like early 300s uh, CE up through you know the next three or four centuries. And most people would probably recognize this time period as the Dark Ages. Right. That's right. sort of what it's more popularly known as. It's sort of the fall of this civilizational force of Rome. Not mm -hmm. really, uh, but kind of. Uh, In <laughs> and, certain areas. <laughs> right. I mean, it is kind of a post-apocalypse also, right? It's a post-apocalypse scenario, yeah. right? And it, it's it's different in all these different places, right? In some places, yeah, it's barbarians at the gate, you know, yeah. burning down everything. And in other places, it's the barbarian that you invited in and has been fighting your wars for you for three generations, just replacing the one guy. You know, you still mm -hmm. do the same thing you were doing. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, they speak a different language now. Yeah. <laughs> the tax collector does. And it's this period of transition. Uh, historically speaking, I love periods of transition. I find them the best just imagination fuel for RPGs. This time period, this transition from civilization that was self-conscious of itself as a superior force in the world. And, mm -hmm. and when uh, Rome merges with Christianity, it's sort of like we are the fulfillment of God's plan on earth kind of thing. You yeah, know? yeah. And now it's falling apart around us <laughs> and we don't know what to do and there's this yeah, well, other civilizational force that's rising and well as we learn most plans don't survive contact they really so don't. <laughs> they really don't you know so don't make plans <laughs> just don't make that's what plans what history teaches us jeez god why did, why did you go ahead and make that plan i find it a fertile period and it's yeah. also one of those where you look at it and and I, I look at like the actions of individuals like individual emperors or individual uh officials within the imperial government and just go like what's going on like what happened that we went from this sort of enlightened self-interest and what's good for you know me is good for the empire kind of thing to this very self-centered self-focused sort of attitude mm -hmm. and i've used it in campaign setups for like all right here's how the state of the world looks like the empire is on the decline individual provinces are breaking away saying that they can you know do more uh, you know, do, do more to defend themselves if they were independent than if they're still a part of this, uh, you know, empire. You know, an ineffectual monarch or emperor or something that's weak and, and easily influenced and things like that. I mean, in a D&D context, there's, <laughs> there's your witches and your evil advisors that come in. There's mm -hmm. monsters that can take advantage of this. Maybe this is a time in your campaign where, like, this is when necromancy made a huge comeback. Because yeah. it's like there's no force out there to stop bad magic from getting practiced and passed around. Yeah. So now all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, we can raise armies of the dead and this, that. And so I really like late, late antiquity uh, is that fun one. And then I merged that with a little bit of the Black Death. You know, that's always a fun one. Uh, Plagues and diseases spreading is... Right. Uh, uh, certainly of the time that we're in. Exactly. So. <laughs> the Black Death is one of those uh, that I drew a lot of inspiration from because it was so traumatic. Yeah. And it, it made such an impression on the people's lives at the time and on culture and art and, and everything around it that you can 
get a lot of just inspiration from it. Mm -hmm. You know, the people walking through, uh, you know, villages and, and, and it's just stacks of dead bodies or people who are sick and and in need of help just wandering the roads until they collapse from death by illness, looking for someone to help them. And like in that pain and tragedy, I like using that to contrast the heroic actions of characters so that we can get some good heroic fantasy going, you know, like mm -hmm. the, you have a chance to stop this or save it or change uh, the course of mm -hmm. history. For my Star Bound uh, campaign, I, I kind of laid out all of the, the intergalactic affairs based off of like World War One and World War Two. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I know you're an ancient history guy. Yeah. I, I love like recent history, like the last century, there's just oh, yeah. so much. There's you a know, lot, yeah, that, oh, yeah. and, and we have such a record of it, obviously. You know, there were two intergalactic wars, and, and the way I, I put all the factions of the Allies versus the Axis powers. Yeah. And so that was just kind of the, the rough framework to set up the campaign. And then yeah. everything that happened after that, happened. Yeah. you know, it's whatever, but at least it informs the, the history of my world where you just kind of I did more than file the serial numbers off. Yeah, you know, yeah, I changed yeah. a few little things, but at least I can just know because it's like, oh, yeah, the you know Germans were the beholders and yeah. these people were the Russians. Exactly. You know, yeah. The Lithids were the Russians and <laughs> they helped us now, but now they're like, mm, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And now we're after them. And, and it's a good way to do some heavy lifting for yourself conceptually, yeah. right? I've got this framework and because you're drawing on actual human events that, that uh, actual people <laughs> had to navigate through, to me, that's always going to be a, a deeper well mm -hmm. to draw from than literary sources because the one precedes the other. I, I don't know how to explain it. To me, it's sort of self-evident thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's fa fact is precedes fiction. What are some of your other your other favorite uh, historical events? Because like I said, mine was, I did World War II. I also think that the Cold War would be yeah. a great framework to start a campaign. Oh, Two certainly. major powers. There's some mutually assured destruction, whether it's magic or one yeah, has dragons. Yeah. And so they do a bunch of proxy wars with other countries and provinces. Yeah. Because they can't go to war themselves because they know what will happen. In a world with D&D &D magic, mm -hmm. that's a very real possibility, right? Yeah. Like part of the limitation of medieval warfare is just how little power they can bring to bear to force another. Because they got to take <laughs> all that and they have to feed all those people. Oh, they got to feed them. them all. They got to convince them to stay for more than two months. Yeah. <laughs> you know? They got to go back to their harvest. Come on. Yeah, yeah. And, and so like the ability of a, of a state uh, to to wage war is one of those things that increases over time and you get to the 20th century. Like D&D &D kind of skips ahead of all that by having magic. Mm -hmm. and monsters and, and all sorts of things. Which kingdom has the most stabs of the magi and dragons that they've uh, <laughs> allied themselves with mm -hmm. or, or something like that? You can get in a situation where, yeah, we can't act on our own. We need small groups yep. of highly trained and specialized individuals to, to engage in subterfuge mm -hmm. and the like in the borderlands between our respective states. Yeah. It's a perfect setup for D D game. To me, one of the times and it's another transitionary period mm -hmm. that I love and really want to run a game in and be inspired by is the Hellenistic period. So this would roughly be from the death of Alexander the Great in uh, three was like 323 BCE up through what is formally considered like the fall of the Roman Republic. Yeah. Uh, in 31 uh, BCE. And so it's a period in which there's this massive cross-pollination of religion and art and philosophy and warfare and, and all this political intrigue that goes on, especially right after Alexander the Great's death. You know, like all of his generals vying for control, capturing his body and fleeing with it across the desert to Egypt. Well, in the, in the intro, you said one <sighs> one individual rarely rarely affects history so much, but I remember you telling me, like, yeah. like no, I mean, didn't he literally just go, here, fight for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alexander the Great is one of those people who is definitely a PC, as are his mom and dad. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, totally. They are all three. They are a family of, of player characters. And yeah, on his deathbed, after you know going past the Pillars of Hercules and like actually going to India and being like, oh, yeah, this is the place that exists beyond Persia, and convincing an army of Macedonians and Greeks and Persians and Egyptians and others to go with him and found these cities, and every one of them is this trying to model off the philosopher kings of Plato and Aristotle and the like. And then on his deathbed in, in Babylon, it's just like, oh yeah, here's my ring. I, you know, fight it out amongst yourselves. Whoever <laughs> is, he goes to the strongest. Yeah. You know, and of course, having a, a, you know, a massive empire that you're just like, oh, 
whichever one of the generals can win it for themselves gets to keep it. It's a recipe for, you know, decades of civil war. Yeah. That spurs this sort of military kind of revolution where Alexander the Great style becomes the style that everybody else uses. You have war elephants and mixed arms and these massive battles and, and armies that in some cases you're not going to see for centuries uh, more. And, and it's just this fascinating time. It's a time when tiny little city-states, like places in, say, Sicily or, or you know, one of the Greek city-states that you're less familiar with, or, or even like the Celts in Gaul and, and, uh, and Iberia, are able to, like, found these places for themselves. And a lot of them are multicultural. They might be like, Greeks founded this city, but then, like, Celt Iberians came in afterward and sort of lived here and mixed with the Greek culture, with their own native Celt cultures, like all of these things going on. It's polytheistic, it's pirates and conquest and magic and everything. And it's like such a D&D &D world, yeah. the Mediterranean at this time, yeah, yeah. that I'm like baffled it's not that more drawn from. And, 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 and it fits so much better than the medieval world in terms of like how deity treats religion uh, and oh, magic and the like. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Another one of mine is the the actual like state of the world leading up to World War One, yeah. right? Because like all the countries, they all know each other. Most of them are right. related, like the kings and queens and mm -hmm, leaders are mm -hmm. all related. <laughs> they all have all these stockpiles and they don't really want to go to war, but they have these treaties yep. and there's just this one inciting incident. Yep. And it's like, Shit. Well, now, yeah. we, now we got to fight. And yeah. so, like, that kind of, like, struggle between the, you're, like, having to fight your cousin, yeah. you know, uh, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but you'll be home by Christmas. Yeah, be home. It'll, It'll be, be fine. Home by no, Christmas. don't It'll worry about it. Especially, like, the days leading up right after the mm -hmm. assassination of the Archduke. And then you're, like, there's a month where there's all these diplomatic missives coming back and forth, i.e. sending stones and mm -hmm. familiars coming back and forth. And there's a sense from the monarchs of, like, we can't stop this. This yeah. is out of our hands what's about to happen. If you're reading this and you're in the real world, you're like, what the hell? What, what are you talking about? You can't stop this. Just don't do it. <laughs> Just don't do it. But the way they talk about it is, like, well, we can't. And even, like, the generals who are in charge of the military is like, yeah, this seems like a bad idea. Not all of them, but maybe some of them are like, like a bad idea, uh, but we can't stop it. You know, the trains are running on time. If we were to reverse the trains now, think of the pile up of man and materials and this, and we got a timetables we got to meet. And mm -hmm. if they're doing it and we back off, then we're just going to leave ourselves open for attack. And like all of these assumptions being made and everything. And like, if you just think about it for a second, throw in a Gesh spell. Oh, yeah. That's like your generals in your army. They're not just like you didn't just promote them, but you've magically enchanted them to loyalty. Like mm -hmm. they cannot do anything other than fight your war for you because that you don't want them falling to the enemy. You sequestered their mind in that way. You've also taken away their ability to act mm -hmm. and, and make uh, decisions. And you're headed towards this massive conflict that's going to engulf and change everything. Yeah. yeah, that's, I love that, that's great. Especially when you contrast it with like the arts and culture before the hand and how just celebratory it was. Look how great we are. Yeah. yeah. And then a year later, it's the mud of Flanders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the entire continent is just, it's, uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah, you can see it. You can see the two mighty magic armies, you know, they're, they've got their armies of kobolds and goblins they're throwing at each other and mm -hmm. uh, magic bombs and all sorts of war constructs. Chris, like, Eberron is uh, a bit like the aftermath of that. It's like maybe times. one side, they, they finally invented the crossbow, or like the repeating right. crossbow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, like, it changes warfare yeah, completely. Absolutely. And, and the use of, of, of like mustard gas and other like agents, like, I mean, you just substitute, you know, gaseous. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh Noxious alchemicals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yes. uh, all those spells, <laughs> thaumaturgic weaponry. Mm -hmm. You got any others? I got, I got a couple more. Uh, one of them is sort of related to that Hellenistic period because during this time, there's like the the rise of uh, this intercontinental trade network, the Silk Road. Oh yeah. And it goes across many different uh, climates and biomes and the like. Sometimes it's uh, maritime, uh, especially for that part, portion of it that deals with like the Indian subcontinent. But I really like the the steppe. Right, like part of what I enjoyed about Alexander the Great is all these cities that have his name. Yeah. And then you keep seeing them throughout history and sometimes you'll see them and they have like a changed name a little bit and then they drop the Alexandria and so you can see how these cities sort of develop and grow and prosper in places that are now like Pakistan, uh, Eastern Iran, or uh, yeah, Eastern Iran or, or Afghanistan. In this time, these are like the middle sections of the Silk Road and you'd have these 
massive cities like say Merv or, or Samarkand or something where all of the wealth of that region is kind of concentrated in this location and then there's not really much else there's nomads and step and the like uh, that's out there but you've got this cross-cultural exchange of people from Constantinople and and the Byzantine Empire and, and further Western Europe mixing with like the various Chinese dynasties people you know goods and services from like the Korean Peninsula it's like all of it along this road and when I think of like the big d d settings and I think of them as like continents and worlds and how they interact I think of myself like where's the Silk Road mm -hmm. like when it comes to say Faerun is it that is it the, is it the Sword Coast is I mean it, up and down it, the seem, it really does seem like the Sword Coast is right like, right it would be but then there'd also be one that goes from say the Heartlands all the way to Karatur and, and right right you know, people might not realize they, they think the medieval world it's very small it's very insular it, you know it, and in many ways it is but in many ways it's not there's a lot of internationalism a lot of cross-pollination of art and philosophy technology the plague mm -hmm. <laughs> right the the plague helps you know the the silk road helps to spread the plague it's this period of history and it's massive right it's a gigantic the time the silk road ends is sometime in the 18th century it's height Marco Polo, mm -hmm. the the uh, you know the sort of the great treasure ships of uh, I forget what Chinese uh, dynasty it is that are sort of coming to the rest of the world to sort of show them hey we're we're your emperors guys <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. let us give you some gifts all that's tied to that international trade network and I I really love it and I've always wanted to run a game set along that where. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it involves the logistics of organizing a caravan. We've got to make it to this next way stop before the bandits get us or before we run into the monsoon season or something. So the last ones I have are more like you would use them for either adventures or just like small arcs. Yeah. But again, sorry, I'm going to stay in World War II, but like to me, I love the Battle of Britain. Sure. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a total David versus Goliath, like this tiny little city state yeah. that's holding out against an overwhelming magical force or something like that. Yeah. And that's where you could like start a campaign in the yeah. middle of that, just getting The final bombed. holdouts kind yeah, of. Yeah, just finding final holdouts. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and on top of that, like Dunkirk, like in, like, you know, what if the elves trying to go to the west <laughs> right. get trapped on a beach, you <laughs> yeah. know, and you got to get them off yeah. to get them to their homeland or yeah. something like that. I mean, like just using events like that. Yeah. Um, Dunkirk would make a good like character funnel. Oh, You're just oh, like dude. make make five characters and whoever survives, survives and gets your character. Off. character <laughs> That's yeah. your main guy. <laughs> now using these events though, um there are certain pitfalls oh, certainly. that you're going to want to avoid, yeah. right? Yeah. There's a certain appreciation of history and of other cultures yeah, yeah, that I, you should definitely take into account, right? I, I think so, right? Like anytime you're, you go, uh, you know, looking for historical inspiration, you're rooting around in someone else's deeply meaningful and connected, mm -hmm. uh, you know, past. It's not difficult to get this right. You do your research. You yeah. talk to the people you're playing with. You make sure that in your research and in, in you know, in discussions for your game, that you're aware of any potential pitfalls your players might have. We're talking about just the people at your table, not what other people online or whatever think. But in your research, just make sure you're getting a wide variety of sources and perspectives and whatever. Like mm -hmm. part of historical research is or part of the act of becoming a historian, which is not what you have to do, but it's learning how to synthesize those things and accept that these people in history have different perspectives on this one event. And it's understanding all of them that will give us our understanding of the the fact of the matter. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying you got to do all of that, but being aware that multiple perspectives exist, leaving yourself open to reevaluating them, especially like leaving yourself open to feedback. Saying like, yeah, I might be playing around in someone else's history because it's inspirational to me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to respectfully and with humility be inspired by that and leave myself open to the fact that I might run into <laughs> a, uh, something that I don't see as necessarily like a sensitive issue, but I might not know everyone else at the table what they think about it, or mm -hmm. if I go sharing that experience online, how other people might react. So leaving myself open to feedback from others, to saying like, yeah. oh yeah, maybe I did get this massively wrong, let me do better, <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, but there's a fine line between inspiration and appropriation. Certainly, and, certainly. And, and, and giving it its due. Yeah, and in Dungeons and Dragons, it is a fine line that has been crossed many times. And yeah. so part of the appeal of D&D is that it draws in all of these cultural elements from anything that might be inspirational, but it also scrubs them clean. It divorces them from their cultural context. It might not handle those ideas or whatever as, as, as uh, sensitive as you'd like. Example of this might be 
the way that Rakshasa are presented, where they're mm -hmm. these evil spirits, but if you go looking at the sources for them, where they come from, they're not always evil, no. <laughs> you know? And so, uh, except with like gin you know, and things like that, mm -hmm. and just being careful is the thing. It doesn't mean don't do it. Be inspired, yeah. right? Find something out there, especially if it is not your own cultural history. Like going outside that is a wonderful way to expose yourself to all of these new ideas. And the amount of people from say, Africa, who did a similar, who went on a similar journey to say like Marco Polo, like we're going to figure out what's out here, what's beyond mm -hmm. my homeland, what's out there. There's people like that too, but you don't hear about them, you don't read about them. Learning to go looking for them in uh, in your D&D &D game and using them for inspiration is just, it's really fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you're, if you learn how to like syncretize uh, the events and the people that you're reading about and to like add something of what you like about it, add something that uh, inspires you and getting the feedback from your players, then not only can you change and evolve and transform what you're being inspired by so that it's less ripped off, copy pasted kind of thing, it's mm -hmm. more your own thing and you can avoid those, those moments of, uh, of accidentally offending or whatever, but it's like you can present them something to your players that's so rich and detailed that they will be more likely to engage with it. And mm -hmm. when they do, they'll find it has a depth to it um, that uh, can really enhance their game. And that's the reason we're doing all this work <laughs> is to make for an enhanced game experience, you know? Exactly. <laughs> Just want to make your game better because, hey, if you if you don't read history... Oh, wait, no, no, no. <laughs> you better read history so you can repeat it in your D&D game. Yes, right? yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and don't let it be farce this time around. Yeah. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, Web DM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. But we won't take a hundred years to depict this art of war. It's real events. And... <laughs> it's right there. It's like, it's like I could see it. I looked down, though, mm -hmm. and I put up my little sign that said, Yikes. Yikes! I fell. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat>